Oxygen Blast Technical Seminars are an Intertech production. For instructor-led.net, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com. Hello and welcome to Complete Hibernating. This will be a first chapter introduction. My name is Jim White. In this first chapter of Complete Hibernate, we're going to look at object persistence. Now, exactly what is persistence? Well, it's the capability of a program to store data in non-volatile storage. Now, exactly what do we mean by non-volatile storage? Well, in some sort of file system or a relational database that survives when our application is no longer, no longer running. In fact, survives when our system is no longer running. Now in Java, most persistence is accomplished by storing data in a relational database management system, or as we know it, RDBMS. And we typically use SQL to get that data in and out of that relational database. And of course, also in, J in Java, we use JDBC as our main Java API to connect to that relational database system and send and get data in and out of our system with SQL statements. Now, adding the term object in front of persistence, what exactly does that mean? Well, that's dealing with getting objects and their relationships with other objects persisted in and out of that database. So specifically, what we mean by that, object persistence is about storing or mapping object state into a database. And that usually means mapping an object state, in other words, its member variables, to particular database columns. But it also deals with the fact that we have to think about object state types as typically not aligning with our database types. For example, the last name of our customer might be a string type in Java, but in a database, it's probably going to be something like a var card. Object persistence is also about mapping an object's relationships. What do we mean by that? Well, typically our objects do not stand alone. They have relationships to other objects, in this case customer to address. And exactly how do we get that information persistent in the database? That's also part of object persistence. Now through the years, in many different object languages like Smalltalk, C++, and of course Java, developers have been sold on the benefits of object-oriented programming. Typically, it all revolves around the fact that we like to model and mimic the things in the real world as our objects. Of course, we've also been sold on the benefits of relational database technology. Let's face it, they store and retrieve large amounts of information very quickly and very efficiently for us. Where we run into problems is the fact that these two systems don't always make it easy for us as engineers to build applications. In fact, there's a lot of tedious programming that goes into uh, an application to get that object state and relationship information into a relational database. In fact, some studies have shown that it may be as much as 30 and as high as 70% of our development time is spent on this activity. So it requires object engineers or object programmers, if you will, and related relational database engineers or DBAs to develop a common view or mapping of the system. First of all, that's not easy to achieve, but then secondly, it doesn't always lead to what we call an optimal model for either the object developer or, that, for that matter, the database administrator. This incongruence has several names. You'll hear about impedance mismatch, or the great divide, or the object relational paradigm mismatch. All names essentially pointing to the fact that we typically have an issue with getting object state and relationship information into our relational databases. So if we look deeper into this impedance mismatch issue, we'll see that there are lots of little aspects to the issue, lots of little aspects to impedance mismatch. And to explore that mismatch, let's just take a look at a very small example. Let's say that we were building an application whereby we had customer objects and we had address objects. And indeed, we even have a relationship between the two, where a customer has an address. How should this object model be persisted? Well, we could look at a database and find 
that with regard to this set of object, customer and address, perhaps there are separate tables for customer and address. Or we might find that DBA chooses to put everything, all properties from customer and all properties from address, into a, a single customer table. Maybe they do that for denormalization for performance reasons. The issue here is, as we can see just by this small example, determining how to create the database, determining how to develop our objects, there are different principles, there are different things that both need out of their systems. And those, do, those two don't always align. So the correlation between our object types to our database tables is not usually one-to-one. -one. Performance needs, as I mentioned, with regard to the database, tend to make objects a little bit smaller, a little bit more fine-grained than what we typically find in relational database tables. Not always, but this is kind of one of those typically type of cases. And having to keep the identical identical structure in both the object world and the database world might destroy our object's ability to mimic that real world, which we usually see as a favorable result of doing object-oriented programming. So there's one issue right there in that little simple example that points to that impedance mismatch that we usually encounter with regard to object persistence. How about another one? We talk about generalization or inheritance in our object world. And we take another small example. In an object world, say for example, we had an account superclass with savings account and checking account subclasses. How would we get that information into the database? Well, here again, the answer depends. We might find that with regard to the database, there might be single tables for each of the types a completely normalized type of database relationship setting there. However, the DBA may choose to put everything again, all properties of all types, into a single account table, thereby having lots of denormalized structures in there. For example, thinking about all accounts, would all accounts necessarily have, say, a checking fee? And then we also might see the DBA choose to put savings and checking account information in separate tables, but replicating the superclass information, the account information, across both of those. So here again, we see impedance mismatch across that object to relational paradigm. Another case for impedance mismatch. When we think about objects, we're always talking about the possibilities for polymorphic behavior. Say, for example, if we had a customer and that customer was allowed to have an account, how would we deal with that with regard to savings and checking account types? From a database perspective, we're going to have to build that relationship in through some sort of key relationship. Foreign key relationship is what DBAs like to talk about. So in our customer table, yep, we'd have an account ID, but we wouldn't exactly know what that account key would point to. Would it point to a savings account? Would it point to a checking account? Without some additional information, our customer row really wouldn't know whether it was related to a savings account or checking account. And of course, as you can imagine, trying to bring that information into the object world creates difficulties. Rows in a table and objects also mismatch on the idea of identity. When we talk to a DBA, a particular database row is very succinctly, uniquely identified. All rows in a database typically have a primary key. When we think about objects, the idea of a primary key doesn't translate really well. Why is that? Well, just the idea of identity alone in Java has many different meanings. When we think about equality, for example, what does that mean? Well, if we're running the dot equals method, then we're talking about equality as far as maybe some of the properties in those objects is concerned, in this case, account A and account B. When we're talking about the equal equal operator, well then identical or equality in this case has a different meaning, meaning that both account A and account B references point to the same object in memory. Boy, try explaining that to your local DBA and talk to them about identity and equality in relationship to what they as DBAs would see as a primary key on a row. 
don't always translate really well. Another case for impedance mismatch. For more free learning resources and to see the latest lineup of our instructor-led.net, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com.